Hello, folks. Welcome to the next Mass Bio virtual series and forums. As you guys all know, we're going to try to continue to communicate with the members of all of our Mass Bio, uh, all the employees of our Mass Bio member companies virtually until we get through this crisis. A big topic as of late, you all know it, is the CARES Act that has been enacted by our federal government. It affects our industry in many, many different ways. And we wanted to be able to get information to each and every one of you uh, as efficiently as possible. Albeit there's still significant unknowns there, we've been able to pull together a panel of experts in this space from both the legal community and the banking community to have a discussion and hopefully point you in the right way. As you know, smaller companies, smaller biotechs have been hit very hard during this crisis. And you know, it's our job here to provide an update and answer questions that you may have. Keep the questions coming and we will answer them to you individually as we can. But for now, we thought that this panel would be very helpful to you and to introduce our panelists. And I, I wanna thank these panelists so much for taking the time out of their very busy schedules right now. You can imagine how busy these folks are. Uh, in current times, especially responding to the needs of their customers as it relates to the CARES Act. But I want to turn it over to um, one of our great member companies at Morse Law. I want to hand, turn it over to the moderator of this panel, Mr. Matt Mitchell. So Matt, why don't you take it from here? You introduce the panelists. And again, thank you each and all of you for doing this. We'll get through this and we'll come out stronger on the other end. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Robert. I welcome all our viewers to this panel discussion sponsored by the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council concerning the CARES Act. I would like to thank John Hessian of Morse and Elizabeth Steele and Chris Lindgren of MassBio for spearheading this program. My name is Matt Mitchell. I'm chair of the employment law group at the business law firm of Morse. I also lead the firm's working group that is assisting clients navigate various COVID-19 responses. We are certainly in extraordinary times. The biotechnology community holds a critically important position at this moment in history. This position is reflected in Governor Baker's order that identifies the Commonwealth's biotechnology industry as primus inter pares, first among equals, in terms of essential businesses during COVID-19 response periods. The governor's order must be read to mean that biotechnology industries and, and companies have the legal and ethical obligation to maintain business operations, to continue to develop and innovate during these difficult times for the benefit of national public health and for our national and local economies and communities. This means in turn, that is fundamental that biotechnology businesses adopt strategies, including strategy, strategies related to government sponsored relief programs to ensure they can remain productive in an economic environment that is unprecedented in terms of challenges. This brings us to the topic of today's discussion, breaking down the CARES Act and how it impacts your business. The format of today's discussion is a panel roundtable of subject matter experts whom I'll introduce in a moment. Based on member feedback, we've prepared 10 questions to cover. We will leave time for viewer questions, which may be uh, made in written form by using the Q&A tab in the lower portion of your screen. As to our panelists, we've gathered an all-star cast for you. I will ask each to introduce themselves. Uh, Cynthia, maybe I'll ask you to start. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Cynthia Bai. I'm a partner in the debt finance group at Cooley. I, uh, in normal times, work with uh, work a lot with lenders um, that are in the venture debt space, um, representing them on loans to tech and life science companies, as well as uh, loans to funds. Um, and also, I of course consult with our company clients on their debt finance related matters. Um, that's been my focus for my career. That's, uh, and I'm involved in the task force uh, for the COVID response equally. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Scott, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Chamberlain. I'm with Cambridge Trust. Uh, I lead the innovation banking group here at Cambridge Trust, which has a focus on early 
and mid-stage tech and life science companies, primarily here in New England. Uh, I've been working with that sector uh, in the marketplace in the banking environment for about 25 years, uh, both in Silicon Valley as well as here in Boston. So thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Scott. Let's uh, begin the questions. We'll start with Cynthia. I suspect that most viewers understand the basics of the PPP loan program. It may have even applied at this point. However, to anchor and frame today's discussion, could you provide a brief high-level overview of the PPP loan program? Yeah, so not, not to get into all the nuances, but at a high level, the PPP program is, is part of the response um, to the crisis that came out of the CARES Act. And really the, it, the purpose of it is to uh, protect the paychecks and in other words to help keep people provide a way to keep people on payroll and so the whole idea is to give small businesses the funding um, to retain employees and so people are able to apply for loans um, where that are based on two and a half times of a average monthly sort of payroll cost and then the loans are unsecured not required to be guaranteed and are eligible for loan forgiveness to the extent that the proceeds are used to uh, pay payroll and pay other eligible costs. Great, thank you, Cynthia. Just a follow up, uh, some commentators have described the PPP loan program as free money. Could you describe at a high level the eligibility and borrower certification requirements including the requirement that the borrower affirm that current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary. Yeah, so this is, this is a, you know, so very, very few number of words there, um, but, but there's been an increasing focus, I think, over the last couple of days over what exactly does it mean um, to certify that the loan is, is necessary for continued operations. And, um, and I think there's increasing sensitivity to the fact that um, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny of the program and how the funds were deployed once the dust is settled. Um, and you, know, the, you can already see the New York Times expose writing itself and the Pulitzer Prize is being awarded for the people who write those articles. But, but I think institutional investors are sensitive to the fact that um, you know, there's probably gonna be increased scrutiny for any institutionally backed companies that are accepting these funds. And um, so what we've been really advising clients is that it's really important to um, have a contemporaneous record um, where it shows that the company evaluated the options. And um, even though the um, credit elsewhere test, which normally would apply to SBA, to any, S any SBA loan that's part of this program, and just really quickly, the credit elsewhere test normally is a, is a test that would require a company to demonstrate, hey, it's not possible for me to get credit elsewhere. And, and, and as part of it too, what would that would include is, um, I don't have equity investors that are able to invest uh, an amount into the company that would cover the amount that I need. Um, because of the complexity, really, of the calculations that are normally required to back up that, um, that test, the government determined it's just not feasible to push out $349 billion of loans to, to, keep, you know, to keep small, business, small businesses going in the world, especially if they're rolling this out to a bunch of financial institutions that normally are not even active in this program. So, so what I've been telling people is you should not understand the CARES Act language and this other language in the rule making that's come up subsequently that says, hey, the credit elsewhere test doesn't apply, it's waived. You shouldn't understand that to mean that uh, the intent of the legislation is we don't care whether you have credit elsewhere or it's an irrelevant consideration conceptually, whether there's credit or equity available elsewhere. It's just that the backing up of that is too complex. And so in lieu of that, they're asking for a certification as to, hey, I really need this, basically. So, so what we've been saying is really consider carefully, make sure that the investors are all willing, you know, in their capacity as board members to sign off on a resolution 
that approves the application and that they're aware of the certifications that are being made as part of it. Um, because, um, you know, all this, inform all this will be available uh, publicly later, right? Like people will be able to request all the data about who used, who obtained funds, how much, et cetera, under FOIA requests. Um, and we anticipate that will be happening. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Scott, I suspect uh, these issues are in the forefront of people's minds. So I want to ask you a broad question. Uh, can you provide some practical details on how the PPP loan program is being affected from a lender's perspective? And I'll give you a few themes to talk about. You know, how do you apply for a loan? What does first come first serve really mean? What happens after the application is filed? What is the lender review process? Who determines eligibility? How long is it going to get, uh, take to get paid? Uh, should applicants expect individual banks to use perhaps different application forms that have been published? So if you could um, give us the perspective from a lender and maybe keep some of those themes in mind. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. And uh, this has become um, effectively a full-time job over the last uh, several weeks. But uh, yeah, the, the, so, you know, my suggestion is to go to the bank um, where you currently do your banking. Um, most banks, I think, are participating in this process. Uh, I think Wells Fargo was capped uh, as of yesterday, but then I heard something today that uh, the federal government has taken that cap off. So um, every bank um, will send you the form that you can download at treasury.gov or sba.gov. Uh, we've also taken the step of putting together kind of a spreadsheet um, that gives us some additional information uh, for your business. And really two overriding themes that I'm always suggesting to our clients, which is um, make sure you fill out that documentation thoroughly, uh, provide all of the backup information requested, um, provide that in, in hopefully one email so that we can review that information, you know, create a zip file, get that on the system. And then the second overriding um, piece of advice is just to be patient. Um, this is an unprecedented times, not only for, for us here at Cambridge Trust, but for all bankers in general. Um, this has literally become a second full-time job for all of us. And we're working um, basically night and day to get this out. So once you apply um, to answer the question, you know, is there any sort of special treatment that goes on? I mean, I can say specifically for our organization from the top down, it is a first come first serve. It has nothing to do with whether you're a borrowing client or a non-borrowing client. We are limiting the program initially, um, at least for the foreseeable future to our clients in general. Um, but so if you're our largest client and you get your application in last, that application will be processed last. And we're doing that under the Fair Lending Act. So once the application comes in to, to our group, at least I'll speak to our group specifically, um, myself or one of my one of my colleagues will review the information, make sure that that every box is checked that needs to be checked, every every place that needs to be initialed is initialed. Um, review the do a cursory review. It's not an in-depth review; it's a cursory review of the attachments, the information, and then submit that to our process. Um, that goes into a queue, uh, as you can imagine, um, ourselves as well as our our colleague banks out there. We've been overwhelmed with requests. So from a timeline perspective, I can't give any uh, timeline on, on when these will re be reviewed and, and what, you know, what we can expect that way. Um, but the next step in the process, in addition to submittal, getting it into the queue, then we submit that to the SBA and we get what's called an ETRAN number. So as of this morning, if you listen to you know, any of the news reports, about $60 billion has been reserved under the $349 billion program. That doesn't mean that, that 60 billion has been dispersed to individual businesses, but 60 billion has been approximately reserved under the 349 billion. So we're going through the process now of, of submitting it, getting the trend numbers. And then after that, we are waiting for guidance from the SBA, which we hope to see. Um, there's been rumors we saw a little bit last night that we'll start to see more today and in the foreseeable few days of what the loan documentation is going to look like. Because believe it or not, everyone, the, the documentation from a legal perspective on how this is going to be documented, what sort of promissory note and how long that document will be is not um, out in the public domain as of yet. So we are waiting for that. 
Um, and once that happens, get the that sign, get it back in, get it up on the, our system, then the funds would be dispersed. And again, I go back to my over, overriding theme of you know, everyone really needs to be patient. We're, we're working as hard as we can, and hopefully we get these processes as quickly as we can. Yeah, thank you. We have one quite question from a viewer. Is there any advantage or disadvantage to applying through more than one bank? Um, I'll, I'll talk from personal experience. I, I don't think that um, that's in your best interest. Um, the government is asking you not to do that. I think from an ethical um, <clears throat> viewpoint, I don't think you should. Um, I, you know, it, it is possible that you know companies have more than one bank uh, for for a variety of reasons. Um, but I would suggest, and the government is is enforcing that, that only one application be submitted, and only one loan is going to be made through this process. The, the, the final rule says that 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 um, well the quest there's a question and it says may I apply for more than one PPP loan and then the answer says no and then the answer goes on to explain that you can really only get one and it, from the angle that like can I apply for one you know this week and then in four weeks I might want to apply for another one and, and it's explaining that can't happen but I think it pretty clearly says, can I apply for more than one loan? No. So I think it yeah, also is in the interest point. of getting, getting this up. I don't think that they would want the whole system gunked up with everybody applying with three banks just in case to get, you know, cause it's just gonna, this is already such a logistical <clears throat> Herculean effort for the institutions that are pitching in the process. Yeah. Thing. And following up on Cynthia's point, I think if, if you think that because you can't get two PPP loans, or that you should really, if, if you're trying to maximize that, it's two and a half times your average monthly payroll for the prior year. So um, if there's any question, you know, take, you know, take the maximum amount. Um, if you don't end up using it, you can always retire that or, you know, hopefully you're using it on payroll and the, and the majority of that is forgiven. Great. Well, thank you. That's a good answer. Uh, this is for Cynthia. To say the least, the rules around the PPP program have been a moving target. Over the weekend, yesterday, and I think just this morning, the Department of Treasury has issued implementing regulations and guidelines related to the so-called affiliation rule. Uh, what is the affiliation rule and how does it impact PPP loan eligibility? So affiliation really comes in to determine whether uh, an applicant is eligible based on size. Um, and that's because um, the whole idea is that this is a small business program. And so you're supposed to be within uh, 500 employees is the number that applies to most businesses. There's a, there's a for cer certain businesses, uh, a, a, a higher number um, based on the NAICS code, which is an industry classification code. Um, <clears throat> and, and in determining the number of employees, an applicant is required to count also the employees of any affiliates. And so what, 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 that, what the result of that is for, for a venture back company is that conceivably you would have to aggregate not just your employees with the employees of your VC, but all the portfolio companies of your VC, which then, you know, potentially has you have uh, many, many more employees than you would be allowed to. And so what folks have been working on um, is trying to figure out what are the parameters of affiliation? Is there a way to avoid being affiliated with your institutional investor? Um, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 the main basis for affiliation would be, first of all, if there's 50% or more ownership, then definitely there's affiliation. Even if there's less than 50%, though, it doesn't matter whether it's 20% or less than 20%, by the way, that's a 20% is thrown around in the applications some places, but there's, there's no statutory basis for 20% being a cutoff. So, so anything under 50% could be uh, an affiliate if they have control. How do we find, figure out if they have control? Well, there's two things. One is do they control the quorum of the board. Um, and the other 
is do they have um, restrictions that are sort of negative controls on like day-to-day -day operational activities? Do they have too much control over the day-to-day uh, -day operations? And so um, there's, there's a case law establishing what's sort of day-to-day, -day, what's extraordinary. Extraordinary things are okay to have control over, but day-to-day -day things are not supposed to have control over. And so what folks have put together is um, some amendment and approach where you would amend uh, typical charter and financing documents to remove the offensive um, controls in order to deaffiliate, basically. Um, and just, I mean, one, one thing to keep in mind is that um, it's okay for, for example, let's say you have Series A preferred stock. If it's like there's two investors and Series A preferred stock can control X, Y, Z, whatever the matters are, right? Issuing dividends or incurring debt or something like that. That's fine. It's just, it's, it's, if, the, it's if the one investor can. That's what causes the problem. <clears throat> Thank you. So as I understand the affiliation rule, in particular for some of our, I, I, th I suspect for a lot of the viewers who are venture and PE backed, the implication is for counting the number of employees for purposes of eligibility, you may have to count the employees of the, your affiliates, which may in practical terms mean that you may have to count all of your co-portfolio companies who are common to your institutional investor. And we've seen a lot in the, in the news about um, this issue. There's been some lobbying efforts to uh, relax the affiliation rule in an attempt to allow startups and venture and private equity firms to apply. That does not seem to be the case right now as the regulations stand, the affiliation rule uh, applies to venture and PE backed companies. Um, this is a question for Scott. What are the lender obligations in terms of making affiliation rule determinations or you know, other eligibility determinations for a loan applicant? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and one that um, I think is, is a little bit more black and white today than it was a week ago, but um, the SBA has issued some guidelines um, a couple of days ago on the 6th basically saying that we, um, the borrowers, it's on the borrower, um, the client company to certify that they're not affiliated or, or the affiliation rules do not apply. So that has given um, lenders such as ourselves some comfort that we don't make a mistake and end up paying for it on, on the, uh, the backside of the transaction. The one, the one area that, we're, that I just wanted to touch on for a second on affiliation and, and, and maybe get Cynthia's uh, position as well is, for companies that are venture private equity backed, um, but in, or, or even venture have venture debt, if you will, um, if any of those firms have taken on SBIC leverage, I mean, the SBIC is part of the SBA, um, and there's not a materiality test to that, that is a, uh, at least as I understand it, at least the, what we're working off of, that is a, uh, a workaround to the existing affiliation rules. And I don't know, Cynthia, if you want to. Yeah, then no, no, that's, that's that exactly right. There's, 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 there's basically four exceptions to the um, affiliation rules. Um, three of them were in the CARES Act, one of them came out subsequently. The first one is, as you mentioned, if you have financial assistance from an SBIC. Um, which we in, which we think includes a loan, no matter how small, or an equity investment, um, and it also includes if you are in basically the hospitality industry. Um, those are um, those are exempt to the extent that each location has less than 500. Um, it excludes franchises, and it also excludes faith-based uh, organizations to the extent that the uh, the connection between the entities is based on a, a religious uh, reason or something. One issue, Cynthia, I want to touch base on, and you had mentioned this in your prior answer, um, there may be strategies for um, applicants who may have minority owners who have blocking rights, as you described, to waive those through uh, irrevocable waivers. Yep. 
Uh, Scott, in terms of documenting that on an application, are, are you, would you recommend that the applicants uh, include detailed information about uh, descriptions of minority shareholders to clarify that there's no affiliation or is the, are the bank's position that the applicants are certifying so the bank is washing its hands of those determinations? Yeah, I mean, I think with the companies that I work with, um, they are certifying so that I think should suffice, but, you know, it, it probably only takes a few minutes to put together an addendum or a couple of addendums of, of, of anything you think the lender should know um, so that there, there aren't questions, because I think what's going to happen is as your loan gets through the process, you know, there could be the potential for you know questions from somebody that's looking at it right so then they're going to have to get a hold of me or one of my colleagues in that situation um, to clarify so anything you can put uh, probably more information the better um, on the application is, is my recommendation right i think it depends a little bit on what what the form of application is i mean there was a, obviously a form put out by the by the sba which it's not necessarily that's not necessarily the form that all of the lenders are going to use but that called for a schedule attaching 20% owners. So our take is that if you have 20% owners, you have to list your 20% owners. You can't just say, don't worry about it. Um, they're not affiliates. But the thing is um, to then have to also list all the portfolio companies of the 20% owners, that could get kind of cumbersome. So um, so there's we're, we're actually still trying to figure out and, and, and we're talking to the individual lenders and it's probably a good idea for folks to speak with their individual lenders as to whether they want to have, um, I mean, if, assuming that that sort of question is, is, is framed in the same way as it is in the, in the, in the SBA sample uh, form of borrower application, uh, whether they, how they want to handle uh, getting detail uh, at the portfolio company level uh, when they've already made the determination that the controlling investor is not an affiliate. All right. Thank you. I have a question from the viewers, which relates back to our discussion, Scott, about um, uh, these sort of borrower uh, lender determinations. Um, I understand that many of the payroll companies are uh, providing reports to their customers because the loan amount is calculated by essentially taking your 2019 total monthly payroll and multiplying that times two and a half. And total monthly payroll includes more than uh, simply cash compensation. So the uh, payroll companies are providing these packaged reports to clients that they can then turn around into loan applications. Uh, one of our viewers is asking, can the uh, applicant simply attach the paychecks or ADP payroll re re report, and would that satisfy a, a, a lender? Yeah, absolutely. So whatever you can get from your payroll provider um, should suffice. I mean, we're seeing, you know, some of our smaller requests have had as few as a few documents, including that. Um, some have had as many as 50 attachments with, you know, monthly um, healthcare records and things like that. Healthcare. Um, uh, proof of healthcare billings. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's an easy um, attachment to, to add to the application. Okay. Uh, so sort of a follow-up question to this line. Um, do you think the complexity of the affiliation rule or other complexities with respect to appl applicant certification, you know, notwithstanding the fact that the certification burden is clearly on the borrower, but do you think that's going to affect the processing and the time frame for processing these loans? You know, my, my view is that it probably is not, um, albeit, you know, that's my answer today. And the SBA comes out with new guidelines tomorrow that my answer might change. Mm -hmm. But at, at the end of the day, what the government is asking us to do, us being banks, is to be a conduit to get the money into small business hands. So we are providing some level of review, but again, it, it is a um, maybe a step beyond a cursory review and, and to, to get the money to make sure, you know, we're trying to mitigate any sort of fraud risk. But I mean, a lot of that's mitigated, obviously, because we're limiting that to, to our existing client base, um, people that we know at this point. 
Thank you. Uh, Cynthia, this is a question to you. And again, not to provide legal advice, right? To provide uh, general knowledge, but what's your thoughts on companies in which they, there's affiliation is in question? Do you apply and then figure it out later? Do you wait to make these determinations? Do you have discussions at board levels? Things like that, general advice to the companies where um, there's a question mark with regard to these, the application of this very complex affiliation rule. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I think it's, a, it's, you have to, you have to exercise caution. And I think the thing to really just keep in mind, uh, keep top of mind when thinking through all these issues is, uh, remember what this program was intended to do and whom it was intended to help. And um, what is it going to look like in six months if somebody pulls up the situation and, and, and examines, examines this loan? That, that's, that's really, I mean, so for example, if you have, if, if you have a, a, sh a shade of gray on the affiliation rule uh, and, and you also have a you know, shade of gray on the, on the, on the need, on the necessary to continue operations. Um, I mean, I really need to think about whether you want to move forward and, 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 and document, document analysis, whatever it is that you think supports what you want to do, but create a contemporaneous record. Thank you. Uh, to change directions a little bit, uh, we're waiving further regulations on the forgiveness element of the PPP loan program. Can you explain under what circumstances PPP loans are forgivable and any limitations on that forgiveness? Well, so the CARES Act had said that if they're used for eligible payroll costs, um, after the loan is received for the eight weeks or after the, after the loan is refunded, um, that would be forgiven. And eligible payroll costs included both payroll compensation expense as well as rent, utilities, stuff like that. Um, they subsequently said when they put out the implementing rule, hey, you know, we think what really the focus of this program is, is retain employees. And so we're gonna say that 75% uh, should be for payroll. <clears throat> and so that's, that's the rule is you have to show 75% um, uh, payroll cost uh, that you submit for loan forgiveness and then 25% could be otherwise. There's adjustment, there's an adjustment mechanism on the loan forgiveness um, where if you either are reducing headcount <clears throat> or reducing pay um, and you don't you don't restore it by June 30th, um, where the loan forgiveness amount is sort of proportionally reduced um, by the same percentage as the headcount reduction or pay reduction. But there's some, you know, complexity in the form in the formulas for that. But but that's an, an, uh, another thing to kind of check out and model when you're putting together the the plan and proposal. Right. And one question from a, a viewer. Uh, what are the tax consequences of the forgiven portion of a PPP loan? Uh, th they said that's not, it's not taxable income. Uh, uh, Scott, from, from your perspective, um, and again, I, we understand we're waiting for clarifying regulations uh, around forgiveness, but what is generally going to be the process that a borrower is going to or the interaction it's going to have with the lender in terms of demonstrating forgiveness and um, being able to certify uh, what portion of the loan is forgivable or not. Yeah, great question. And I think folks should be able to give a, or at least do a quick back of the envelope math on what they think the forgiveness piece is going to be. Um, I also like to think, you know, in, in 90 days from now, when these loans are eligible to be forgiven that the, uh, the SBA has a, a, a distinct form or maybe even an online form that, that can be filled out. Um, you know, 75% payroll costs, you know, rent, you know, rent utilities. Um, 
and I think to the best we can have this standardized because the front end of this process has not really been standardized all that much, at least from my viewpoint. So I'm hoping, you know, probably the soonest these loans are going to be forgiven would be 90 days from now. Um, so uh, if there's any amount of luck out there, um, we'll have something that everyone can work off of and everyone will know, you know, based on what their payroll is um, over the 60 days from loan disbursement, uh, what will be forgiven. And, and, but as it relates to the timeline of that, which is probably the follow-up question, um, you know, when that will be forgiven by, uh, by the government, uh, again, that's, um, that's anybody's best guess, right? Because it, I think, if I recall, and Cynthia, maybe you've seen this or remember better than I do, but I think the government has 60 days to reimburse, um, uh, reimburse the bank. So, uh, I thought it was a determination has to be made. Okay. I forget. Yeah, I was looking at that yesterday. I mean, I'm also wondering, um, uh, you know, the other piece of news that came out yesterday was that the Fed is going to backstop the PPP program. So we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I, I guess it looks, it means there's going to be a, some sort of SPV set up uh, that then will buy the PPP loans from the banks today, right now, <laughs> before, the, before the loan forgiveness happens, sort of moving that forward. And so it's not clear to me what that then means. Are the banks still all going to have to handle the, I'm, I'm assuming the Fed still wants the banks to be the, the conduit, if you will, for the loan forgiveness piece of it to administer it. Um, maybe that's part of the um, quid pro quo for, for, for being able to sell the loan to the Fed and get, get reimbursed today. But, but I'm kind of curious what that means um for for the loan forgiveness piece of it if the banks are actually no longer going to be holding the loan at the time when the loan forgiveness application is made okay thank you for that uh, i want to focus on uh, there's a common theme of questions coming up uh, and and this i think is going to be mainly for scott regarding whether the practical experiences the borrowers are going to have with the lenders, the interactions that they're gonna have. And I, I see a number of questions regarding um, individualized um, applications or individualized terms that different banks are uh, adhering to that may be different from what's being advertised or what's being what's in the text of the, of the law. For example, uh, questions about banks having limits on loans that are under the $10 million limit that's anticipated in the act uh, or engaging in additional underwriting um, practices in terms of looking at credit worthiness or things of that nature. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you're seeing in the market and what you're doing um, as well? Yeah, that's, um, yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. And I mean, we're all supposed to be operating under the same set of rules, right? And we're, and we're not, um, there was a concern when this program was just beginning to be rolled out that that credit underwriting, quote unquote, um, was going to be part of the process. And it was clear as more time went by, and we're talking hours and days, not weeks or months, that credit underwriting is not part of this. We are truly, we being banks, are, are a conduit to the dollars from the government. So initially, we had implemented, um, we, we talked about implementing a cap on loans. Um, around, you know, below the, uh, below what someone could qualify for when you multiply the average monthly payroll times two and a half. Um, we relented on that issue and we are providing loans up by four. Um, we've talked about having an, an aggregate bucket um, similar to what Wells Fargo did with their $50 billion bucket initially. Um, I know for a fact that we've gone beyond that at this point. Um, I don't know if there is an upper end limit. There probably is not. If the Federal Reserve is going to buy these on the secondary market, th thus providing additional liquidity, um, keeping ratios in line. So, you know, banks should more or less be operating under the, the, the same rules and regulations. But at the same time, every bank is unique. I mean, there is a bank um, around town or a few banks around town that have that have pushed this process off, even for their clients and, and pushed them to finance companies. Um, because the, the, the general concern is the client experience, right? We're, we're all client service focused. 
And we want to make sure that, that our clients have the best possible experience under the worst possible circumstances, right? So we overlay those two things together. It's very difficult for banks to come out looking good in this. And we're doing everything I can, we can to make that client experience good. But it's, it, that's why I go back to my overriding theme, which is please be patient, everyone. Right. A few uh, additional to related questions to that, Scott. Um, a number of questions about this fund running, running out. So we've just, I think this morning, have heard reports of uh, Congress um, injecting some more cash into this program to get it up uh, above 500 billion. Um, but at the rate of, you know, the, I think it was also reported that 60 billion has been at least authorized um, as of today. So at that rate, um, conceivably, this fund can run out. Um, is it possible, one of the questions that we're getting is, is it possible for this fund to run out of money? And as such, is it possible to apply too late, even though you're within the, um, the covered period for the loans? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think Steve Mnuchin came out and said that uh, yesterday or this morning that he was going to um, put into Congress another 250 billion, which would bring the fund to almost 600 billion in, in total assets uh, as part of the program. Um, I, my own view is I, I really hope they don't run out of money for everyone who applies. Um, so everyone who, who has a need should apply. I guess it's theoretically possible that, that it could run out. Um, I think is what is more likely is, is, is companies receiving funding after, you know, or long after the, the real pain point or need is happening, you know, in the next 30, 60 days. And so if you, you can apply for this up until I believe it's the end of June. Um, but I think in encourage every, encouraging everyone, no matter what spot in the line you are in the queue for your each individual bank is to get your loan in loan request in as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, we're getting, I can see from our viewers, we have a number of, uh, of companies that are uh, delving into the text of these regulations and, um, and very complex laws. So we're getting a number of, uh, I think, very um, nuanced questions. So I'm going to throw, throw a few questions out to the group with the understanding that um, to our viewers, these are completely moving targets. Even this morning, new clarifying regulations were, or, or guidelines were issued. So um, we can give you sort of best guess estimates at some of these answers, but um, uh, we'll go from here. Here's, a, here's an interesting one. Um, this viewer's reading of the affiliation rule indicates that affiliation means all affiliated entities are treated as a single entity for purposes of an application. And therefore, does that mean that if you have two affiliated companies that have under 500 employees, would that preclude, if one of those entities applied, would that preclude the other? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? So, so that has come up as a question. Um, I, we think that we think that it you definitely cannot apply for the same employee right mm -hmm. so if you if you determine your payroll cost you should include the payroll cost for your company and the other company can include the payroll cost for their company we don't read it as the affiliation rule means that it, everywhere in the application where it says applicant you're answering for for all affiliate all companies that are an affiliate. Right, that makes sense. Um, here is an, another um, so very nuanced question. Do US incorporated subsidiaries of foreign corporations qualify? There was, a, there was previously a question on the original borrower application form that was put out that would have precluded that. Mm -hmm. um, that's no longer uh, part of the application. Um, and so the, you can only include payroll costs for employees that are in the US. That's 
that's the case. And you have to aggregate with affiliates, whether they're here or abroad. Correct. But other than that, um, I don't believe that 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 would be precluded. Right. We have we have some viewers who are reporting that several of the banks are are either requiring this or are using the old treasury form. Um, so uh, we'll see how that plays out. Um, other questions that uh, I'm seeing a theme of, and this is for Scott, uh, the understanding that the borrower, it, it's on the bar, again, we, we, this theme that the, it's the borrower's certifications and the bank is, is merely a conduit to facilitating these. But the questions are, are surrounding, how does that work in practically speaking? Is the, the applicants are providing employee size data and perhaps data regarding affiliates. And is that being looked at by the bank in any way? And um, is there going to be a back and forth between the lender and the applicant with respect to the information placed on the application? Yeah, yeah good question. The, I think the answer is, I mean, because we're, we're focused on our existing clientele and, and, I, and I'm focused on primarily my group's clients. I mean, we generally know um, how many clients we have, and I don't, in, at least speaking for my portfolio, um, none of our clients come close to that 500 employee mark, but just generally speaking, um, you know, we're taking your word, your, you know, the, the borrower's word for what they're putting in. I mean, we will do a review. Um, and we hope people who have six, seven, hundred employees are, are not applying for this program, but um, generally speaking, it should be a, um, you know, it, it should just be, you know, simply stated and, and we'll, we'll look at it. Uh, but we're looking more at the payroll information, the dollars, making sure those numbers are correct. I think maybe this goes to your point of, you know, applying with a bank in which you have a relationship with and the, at the bank knows you and mm -hmm. um, that can help facilitate these, um, these applications. Uh, another interesting question from viewers, and this I think is, um, coming off of one of the points that Cynthia made earlier, uh, is industry going to experience a PR problem when the public, when the public sees a bunch of biotechs with cash in the bank and big money VCs taking a portion of these funds? What's your view on that? That's exactly the concern. Yeah, absolutely. People need to, people need to assume, I mean, people need to be comfortable that there's going to, being the star of a Netflix documentary about this and, and that <laughs> look okay, what they decided, honestly. I mean, Here's that's, how, that's, how we're, that's how we're advising. We're advising people in a way that we would be comfortable, you know, later on. Right. A follow-up question here is related. A startup company that has received venture funding and has runway and is pre-revenue, so they're not, their operations are, are covered by existing funds. And um, uh, in making that certification that they've been impacted by COVID-19, are there issues regarding that that are particular to pre-revenue funded startups? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I think the most sort of direct, uh, the most literal example of what people had in mind when they put together this program, if you want to go back to sort of legislative intent, is, you know, uh, Mary's flower shop uh, had to close because of shelter in place orders and has no income and has to lay off all her employees if she doesn't have the support, right? That's, that's the sort of paradigm that we're talking about. You could also say, I mean, if I'm a startup and I'm and I'm tinkering on this, you know, uh, app or something, I don't know, right? Uh, and I and I also have employees and I also have shelter in place order. Uh, and 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 the pro the issue is also not that not necessarily that the shelter in place order is affecting me, but I'm not going to be able to raise funds in this environment. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it, it is impacted. 
but it's not exactly the same. Um, but in the end, the idea is to, to keep people on payroll. So if it's like, if I don't have funds, I'm not gonna be able to keep people on payroll. You maybe still have an angle, but you know, some people, I mean, we've heard of instances where folks have 18 months of runway. Um, and they think, well, my runway is impacted by this because um, you know, I have a setback in my clinical trials or there's various issues, right? That, that people are facing in their operations because of this. And, and, and we think people have to really think hard about those things. Another question from uh, the viewers, and again, more of a practical question. Uh, the loan proceeds are distributed. What can I use the loan proceeds for? Cynthia, you discussed this a little bit earlier. And then who's going to check on how I use the loan proceeds? Well, the loan proceeds have to be used for payroll predominantly. 75% supposed to be used for payroll and related payroll expenses, which is includes sort of compensation um, related stuff and then um, rent utilities uh, and similar things like that. And then I guess who's gonna verify? Well, it's gonna, it's gonna be verified when you apply for the loan forgiveness. That's really the thing. And if you don't uh, submit evidence substantiating that that's what it was used for, then you'd have to pay back the loan. If it was used for, uh, and if it was used for uh, an unauthorized purpose, so let's say, you know, it was used to, uh, pay off existing debt or something else like that, then, you know, it's going to be a question of, does that get caught in an in a, in a investigation enforcement action? I mean, our, our expectation is that there's going to be uh, a focus on examining these, these loans and how things were used, similar to, to what we saw after TARP. Um, probably, I mean, larger scale efforts than TARP, obviously. So... And Scott, this is a follow-up question, related question. Uh, at, on the back end of these loans, when employers are, are providing documentation that certifies the appropriate use, is the bank making that determination or are you passing that on to SBA? No, it, I, at this point it's up to the bank. So we'll be looking at payroll records um, for the 60 day period post uh, loan funding. So maybe give a good example. So one of my clients came to me and said, look, you know, the, our average payroll for 2019 was, is going to be higher than, it, than it's going to be for the 60 day period because we started taking costs out of the business and for the November, December, January, February timeframe, uh, should we still apply? And the answer was, was yes, you should apply if you're affected by COVID-19. However, because you know you're not the payroll expenses are lower. Maybe you haven't laid people off, but your expenses are lower than payroll expenses are lower than what they were in 2019. What's going to happen there is this less of your loan will be forgiven, right? So then you're going to be you're going to be paying. It's it's a six month principal and interest deferral, right? Interest is accruing over that six month period, and then you're amortizing whatever amount uh, of principal and interest over the following 18 months. So that's just something to keep in mind as you look at your 2019 payroll versus the, the subsequent 60 days from post-loan funding. And another um, uh, practical question here, and perhaps this may be a, a it sort of sums up a, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of the issues that we've discussed today. Uh, we've, had heard, we've heard to expect delays in the actual distribution of funds. Uh, what relief options are available for eligible borrowers who are suffering immediate and acute economic distress while they wait for their PPP loan distributions? Yeah, I mean, that is, um, and that's the one that, that, you know, we wish that there was a, uh, you know, we could get the, the funding out quicker. Um, I would say as, a, as someone who's done this for a long time, if you have, if you have an existing loan with a bank, with your bank, with our bank, um, you know, talk to your relationship manager to see what sort of payment relief can be given. Um, if you have, you know, a, a home mortgage, talk to your, your mortgage provider to see if there's relief that way. Um, there are other programs within the SBA that um, uh, maybe Cynthia, you know, the program better um, under, under the EIDL program. I think there is a $10,000 um, 
uh, almost immediate cash advance if you apply into that program, which then could, if you're accepted, it could then, then be added to your PPP loan. Uh, but again, it's all managing cash flow as best you can throughout this process. I haven't heard from any folks that have tried to apply for those, um, for the sort of uh, disaster loan um, and other, other relief that's supposedly available faster um, of them receiving it yet. So that's maybe anecdotal, but I think the problem is that the, the, uh, some of those other um, options are through the SBA. So that means you have all of America descending on the SBA and they're not equipped, obviously, to handle that kind of volume. Could you just to follow up on that, could you just explain the distinction between this PPP loan program, which we focused on today, and this EIDL uh, program that um, is, an, is an alternative loan program, but it's not non-forgivable. So it's a more traditional. Right. Program. Yeah. So, that, so that's a program that, that's an existing program. It's the um, it's economic injury disaster loan. Um, and it's, it, it falls under the sort of disaster relief category of uh, assistance that the SBA makes available. It typically, on other circumstances, addresses things like hurricanes, um, you know, tornadoes, floods, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and so the, the process was already set up. There's already applications, existing applications for, for that. And those were sort of retooled when, when COVID happened. And the terms of the uh, EIDL program were also modified slightly by the CARES Act. But, but the bottom line is, this is administered by the SBA. This is a loan directly from the SBA. So they're not leveraging the network of financial institutions. They have to themselves administer it and themselves process the applications. The, the program is normally required to be personally guaranteed and secured. Um, the CARES Act said that if it's under $200,000, it doesn't have to be. Um, and the other thing that the CARES Act introduces is that there's a uh, $10,000 EIDL grant, which is sort of the in immediate sort of need thing. And, and they said, well, even if you then later don't apply for the EIDL loan, don't worry, it's a grant, it's forgiven. Um, but I, I haven't seen people being able to actually access that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. So I, I just received, I think, a, a nice question to finish off with, with our last two minutes. Is there anything that we haven't discussed today that you think comes up to your mind when talking about PPP loan, the loan program to people? Maybe I'll start with Cynthia. I guess it's, 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 I understand that businesses are in crisis and are trying to manage costs. Um, but I would say that for, for the group of um, companies that have institutional investors, um, it's still worth, and I know this sounds self-serving, but it's, it's really worth walking through it with your, with your counsel because there are so many requirements and nuances and the applicant is really required to take all the responsibility to determine eligibility. The banks are not checking eligibility. They're not required, they're, not, they're off the hook as to eligibility. So if there's an issue later about um, someone was actually not eligible, then it's gonna flow back to whoever did the certification, not just the company, but the individual. And so um, I would really make sure to carefully walk through the requirements because it's gonna depend on the specifics of, of each company. Yeah. And Scott, what about you? Yeah, I know we're running out of time. So my advice to um, my clients who are primarily tech and life science companies is really that this should be part of your overall solution on how you survive 2020, right? So what levers can you pull in the business, whether it's, you know, if you're, you're bootstrapped, whether it's, um, you know, leveraging uh, a home equity line or whatever it is, I mean, this should be part of your overall financing solution, um, especially when we, we don't know um, how long it's going to take um, from the time of application to the time of funding. So have one, two, three different uh, solutions as well, in addition to this one. Great, thank you, Scott. 
I see we are exactly at two o'clock. So that's perfect. I want to thank Cynthia and Scott. This has been very informative. I would like to also thank in particular John Hessian, my colleague at Morse, who and Elizabeth Steele and Chris Lindgren at MassBio for again organizing this. And thank you for all the viewer questions. It shows certainly that um, there is engagement here and hopefully we provided some good, useful, practical information. Thank you and have a good and safe afternoon.